Hello everyone, I'm Stibby, and this is my YouTube channel. I've been thinking about this project for some time, if for no other reason than to justify the amount of times I've watched this show. Superstore is somewhat of what I like to call a comfort show, in that it's a show I like to have on as an anchor point when I'm feeling anxious, or a show that I like to have on in the background to use as white noise. All in all, I would say that Superstore has become one of my favorite shows, but I also kind of feels like it falters in its goals and doesn't live up to where I wanted it to go in some ways. Let's start from the beginning. What is Superstore? The American Superstore. One-stop shopping for everything you could ever want or need. Do you want to be thinner? Fatter. Happier. Sadder. Are you looking for friendship? Or solitude? Or even love? Superstore was an NBC comedy about a collection of employees at a fictional Walmart or Target type department store in St. Louis called Cloud Nine. The show was created by Justin Spitzer, who was one of the primary creators behind The Office, and more recently the primary creator behind American Auto. So, I think it's fair to say that his body of work has somewhat of an obsession with the American workforce. Although this is the most blue collar his shows get, with The Office being primarily about middle management and sales at a mid-range paper company, and American Auto being executives at a high echelon car company. Superstore is, by contrast, focused exclusively on the people of the lowest rung of the corporate hierarchy. Basically anyone that makes more money or has more influence over the day-to-day -day operations of the store than a branch manager is depicted as either a total villain or a complete idiot, and frequently both. The show aired on NBC from 2015 to 2021 and featured a large ensemble cast. What if someone steals a baby? What then? Do you want me to just sit there and watch someone take... A baby? What if the baby is wearing a bomb? Then wouldn't you want him to steal it? I'm trying to picture a scenario in which somebody plans. Oh, what if it's baby Hitler? <gasps> That's oh, yeah. a very good question. Tough. Is it? I think you gotta kill that baby Hitler. Superstore is an ensemble sitcom, and therefore it might be hard to point out all the relevant characters up top. But I'll do my best to point out the most vital characters right now, and then introduce other characters as they become more relevant to whatever I'm talking about. The series starts with the first day at the store for new hires, Jonah Sims and Mateo Fernando Liwanog. I'll start by introducing Jonah as he is the focal point character at the beginning of the show. He's played by Ben Feldman, who you might recognize from his brief stint on Mad Men or his brief stint on Silicon Valley, or from a couple of movie appearances, the most memorable to me being As Above So Below and his appearance in the Friday the 13th remake. Jonah is an extremely liberal to slightly left-wing 30-year-old white guy from a wealthy family who applies at Cloud9 after dropping out of business school. His political leanings frequently make him the voice of reason in situations or the one pushing for social change, but his privilege and self-centeredness just as frequently make him the butt of the joke. In fact, one of his first interactions in the show is him attempting to flirt with someone who he, at the time, doesn't know is his floor supervisor, Amy Dubanowski by implying that she should be surprised that he works there because he is self-evidently better than the image of someone working retail. Nope, let me help you with that. Oh, no, 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 I'm fine. I, That's it's okay. Fine. I work here. It's like my, it's my job to help customers, so. You work here? Since when? Uh, since right now. I'm, I'm, it's actually my, my first day. Oh. I know. <laughs> I don't seem like the kind of person who would work in a place like this. <laughs> yeah. That's why I was so surprised. I was like, what? What? Him? What's he doing cleaning up toilet paper? Amy is who I would call the other main focal character of the show. Amy is played by America Ferreira, who I most recognize from the movie Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, but you might also recognize from her major stint as the main character of the show Ugly Betty. She also has done a lot of voice work as the character Astrid for the How to Train Your Dragon franchise since that franchise's inception. And Amy does not take this flirting attempt from Jonas super well, because honestly who would, but also because of who she is as a character. 
Amy is very proud, but she's also been working retail for a long time and is exhausted by it all. She's the mother to Emma Dubanowski, who at the start of the show is a preteen, and is married to her high school boyfriend Adam Dubanowski, mostly because they had a kid together right after high school. Her defining predicament at the beginning of the show is stuck in a rut, both with her marriage and with her job. She also provides the main counterpoint to Jonah at the beginning of the show. She leans more towards pragmatism in contrast to Jonah's idealism. The interesting thing about that is that she's frequently more likable than Jonah. She's less privileged and more experienced, but doesn't care any less. However, she's also, in my and frequently the show's view, wrong. Her and Jonah also have the will-they-won't-they they of the show that is legally required of all workplace sitcoms. To backtrack a little, the other character that started on the same day as Jonah, Mateo, is also a pretty prominent character. He's played by Nico Santos, who as far as I could tell was the most relative newcomer to the main cast. He wasn't in a lot before Superstore, and nothing that I recognized. The only other prominent credit I saw was he played a character in Crazy Rich Asians, but I don't know a lot about that character as I haven't seen that movie. Mateo starts off the show being defined by his competitiveness, particularly as it relates to Jonah, but increasingly as the show goes on, becomes defined by being kind of a selfish asshole. Just to be clear, I say that all with love, I really enjoy Mateo as a character. There's also Garrett, who is played by Colton Dunn, who I recognize from mostly Parks and Rec, but has been in a number of things, like Key and Peele, he's done some voice work, he was in Comedy Bang Bang, he's been in a lot of places. Garrett is kind of a wisecracking, smartass best friend, who's kind of a dick, but in like a funny way. There's also the manager, Glenn, who is played by Mark McKinney, who has had a long and storied career, but if you recognize him from anything, it's probably Kids in the Hall. Glenn is a very friendly, very positive, and also very Christian man, who frequently has a problem not imposing his beliefs onto others, most especially his employees. There's Dina, who is played by Lauren Ash. Uh, who has also been in quite a bit. Uh, most notably for me, she does the voice for Scorpia in the Netflix She-Ra series. Uh, and most hilarious for me, she briefly co-hosted the show Scare Tactics, uh, which is the sci-fi original show where they pranked people by making them think that they were on a horror movie. Dina is devoted to her job and devoted to security and also frequently a huge bully. And there's Cheyenne Lee, who is played by Nicole Sakura, who has also done a few things, but the most notable for me is that she did the voice and motion capture for uh, the character Emily in the game Until Dawn. Cheyenne is a frequently ditzy or dumb teenage character who starts the show about seven or eight months pregnant. And while they aren't strictly relevant at the very beginning, I think this is a good place to point out that a potential negative of this show is that it has a dearth of what you might call a punching bag character. You have Sandra Kaluuya Kalani and Justin Sikowitz who both start life as characters exclusively as Dina's punching bags, although they both do get more to do later on. Well, at least Sandra does, Justin kind of stays a punching bag character. You also have Marcus Carroll, the district manager Jeff who are frequently the butts of jokes. Uh, it's not necessarily a strict negative. Most sitcoms have a punching bag character or two, but I can definitely see how it could be off-putting, especially considering how many of them there are. I should not have done that impression, but I want to be clear that I was not being racist. I was making a comment about racism. Well, yeah, it's, personally, I'm not a fan of racist comments. No, so. it's not what I was exaggerating on purpose to make a point. Parody. She was making a joke about racism. Yes. Well, are racist jokes okay again? So, with the characters introduced, what is Superstore about? If you read the title of the video, you probably already know what I'm going to identify as the main theme of Superstore. But it's far from the only theme. 
most episodes have their own thing going on. The show is always touching on big societal conversations and hot topics, mostly pretty successfully. I think the Soper Store had a good balance of taking topics seriously enough to not be in poor taste, but not so seriously that they became very special episodes. One of my personal favorites is the Season 2 episode, Spokesman Scandal, where the actor who plays the Cloud Nine spokesman, Kyle the Cloud Nine Cloud, is accused of killing and eating 14 people, which is obviously absurd, but was used to make a commentary on the Time's Up movement that was starting to take off at the time, with Glenn insisting that the actor couldn't have killed an eight people because he had met that actor and he seemed like a nice guy. I'm not going to dive too deep into this here, uh, the commentary is pretty obvious, it's about people using similar lines of reasoning to oppose accusations of sexual misconduct surrounding high profile celebrities. The show also frequently deals with immigration issues, as you find out pretty early on that Mateo is undocumented. He came to America illegally as a child and didn't even know himself until the audience finds out with him, strangely enough in the Olympic side episode. And that theme constantly runs through the series, with Mateo attempting to receive citizenship several times throughout the series, and culminating in corporate calling ICE on the store in Season 4 as part of a union-busting effort. ICE detains Mateo, which leads to most of his storylines being related to getting free from detainment, and eventually trying to get work and live as someone now publicly outed as undocumented. And I think that's the best transition I'm going to get to talk about what I see as the biggest theme in all of Superstore, as well as how it relates to each individual season. And that is the theme of unionization. Um, that's just not something we offer. Okay, but is it like a conversation you guys are having? Because I know other big companies do offer it. Um, typically their employees would be in unions. I'm transferring but now. Please hold. Unionization is one of the first major themes brought up as early as Season 1. It encompasses some of the biggest strengths of the series in just how clearly it's presented as a theme, and some of the biggest late game pitfalls in how it all ultimately ends up. But let's start from the beginning. The Season 1 finale is basically entirely about unions, or at very least an expression of collective power. So. Cheyenne, who has been pregnant for the entire first season, goes into false labor that eventually gives birth in the store. She continues to work after the false labor because Cloud9 does not offer paid maternity leave, and she needs to save money for her upcoming child, as well as the wedding to the baby's father, Bo Derek Thompson. Jonah, being who he is politically, is particularly incensed by this, so he gets Amy to call corporate with him, and during the phone call, he accidentally mentions unions, which leads to a series of phone calls and eventually ends up with a union buster giving a presentation at the store. And so this is why there is a union buster at the store when Cheyenne does give birth, who sees Glenn dismiss her with pay as a sneaky way to give her paid maternity leave. He reports this incident to corporate who fires Glenn, in a move that shakes Amy enough that she leads a strike out of Cloud9 to get Glenn's job back. And that's how Season 1 ends, although it picks back up in Season 2. District Manager Jeff Sutton is called to resolve the strike, which Amy is, at first, willing to do in exchange for Glenn's job, but becomes incensed when she's asked by corporate to send a letter of apology because, as previously mentioned, she's a very proud person and doesn't like being asked to apologize for doing the right thing. So, after becoming annoyed about it, she starts making more demands of corporate, like maternity leave and health care and turning the whole thing into more of a general strike. Now, this is obviously a increasingly ridiculous set of circumstances that led to this strike happening, uh, but it is the first brush the series has with collective action. And as a first brush, this is obviously destined to fail. Corporate crushes the strike with extreme prejudice. They both offer the bare minimum of Glenn's job back, while also pulling in workers from other stores and threatening to fire anyone that doesn't sign the apology and come back to work by the end of the day. The strike, of course, then falls apart, with its entire reason for existing in the first place being no longer viable, and the threat of retribution hanging over it. Plus, uh, it's largely co-opted by a number of different groups for their own things, including a group protesting trans people being able to use which bathroom they want, 
So it's all kind of a disaster from the very beginning. By the end of the episode, the only people left outside are Jonah and Amy, and they have a conversation that points to this just being the first grasp of things to come. You know, just because we go inside doesn't mean it's over. The fight will go on. This was just the first punch. So... To be continued? To be continued. It's not like anyone around here ever reads anything anyway. Yes, yeah, we do. Oh, 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 what was the emergency safety memo I sent out last week about? Um... See? Relax. It'll be fine. By the way, the answer was the building got an F in tornado preparedness. The inspector says this place is a house of cards. In the next couple of seasons, unionization takes a little bit of a back seat, but it never completely goes away. Season 2, after the strike episode, probably has the least strong union theming of the early seasons, and even it has a B-plot in its finale related to corporate's indifference. The B-plot, in question, is about Glenn trying to figure out who to fire in the interest of corporate downsizing. A good chunk of the penultimate episode of the season is spent with Glenn trying to convince Jeff to let him keep all of his employees, to the point of inviting Jeff to Cheyenne's wedding despite his lack of authority to do so to continue negotiations. And the finale is spent trying to figure out who he will inevitably have to fire. But like I said, that is the B-plot of the season. The A-plot is about a tornado hitting the store. And while the tornado plot has little to do with unionization, it is actually one of the best episodes of the show. The episode has a strong character focus, and the tornado thing itself is actually well set up throughout the season, with multiple offhand lines about how bad the store is at tornado preparedness. Which, I suppose you could connect to corporate indifference if you really try, but I think that would be kind of a stretch. These lines are mostly just jokey foreshadowing for people to catch on repeat viewings. This is kind of an aside, but I couldn't think of a better place to put it. I think that Superstore's setup and payoff game for jokes at its best is on par with like Arrested Development and The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, which in my opinion are the best in the field. Anyway, the Tornado episode is a great payoff to the setup of the building Tornado Preparedness rating, as well as a culmination of a lot of different storylines. The most relevant to future setups as far as this video goes is probably Amy's marriage falling apart at home, leading to her kissing Jonah during the tornado, and Mateo's storyline. Mateo had, in an earlier episode, started dating district manager Jeff, but they had to break up because them continuing to date would mean Mateo would have to switch stores, which would have led to his undocumented status being discovered by corporate but Mateo calls Jeff during the tornado to tell him that he's still in love with him. Yeah, and do we even want Myrtle back? I mean, she kind of sucked. Did someone say my name? Did you just tell us ahead of time who all's on the phone? Season 3 starts with rebuilding after the tornado and goes in a lot of different directions after that. The theme of unionization takes kind of a backseat for most of the season to character drama. Amy gets a divorce, Jonah gets a new girlfriend, Dina and Garrett start their own will they or won't they. A lot happens in this season. But as the season draws towards the finale, we again move towards the primary theme of unionization. Or at least corporate indifference and why unionization is vital for the employees of the store in the face of it. To explain why, I'll have to introduce a character named Myrtle who is played by the late Linda Porter. Myrtle is a side character whose main joke is that she's old and has outdated views on things. Like, Glenn will ask for a female perspective on breastfeeding and Myrtle will say, we used to call a woman who took our top off a whore, and everyone will look uncomfortable or like, here we go again for a moment. That description might sound a bit reductive, and that's because it kind of is. This is not necessarily the most complicated social commentary, and it isn't anything you haven't seen before, but I want to be clear. I'm not saying it's not frequently funny, and I'm certainly not disrespecting the talents of Linda Porter. I was a particularly big fan of the Seasonal Hires episode, where Myrtle is upset that one of the Seasonal Hires is older than her. It is genuinely comedy gold. Who else? I got $20 on the old 
bitch. I got her listed as old lady, but I got you, Myrtle. But I bring up Myrtle now because her story intersects with the main themes here. She was fired earlier in the season by the new district manager, but during the finale, Jonah and Amy find out that her firing was part of a company-wide initiative to write up all elderly employees to create pretense for firing them so they would cost the company less money. Finding this out gives the employees leverage for the first time in a while, so they find Jeff, who quit at corporate after finding out Mateo was undocumented, and set up a plan with Jeff to confront the CEO of Cloud9 with overwhelming proof of this during an internationally broadcast town hall company meeting. And while this doesn't have as directly a correlation with union activity as Season 1's strike did, it is still collective action. It was all the workers coming together to hold their CEO to account and bargain for their rights. Of course, the show is not ready to end yet, so this too fails. Corporate figures out what Jeff is planning to do the second he mentions Myrtle's name, and immediately offers him his old job back, while feigning like they really valued him as a member of the executive branch. Which Jeff, who is currently not doing so well financially, accepts basically right away, and doesn't reveal what he knows about the senior firing initiative. I don't want to sound down on this, it is fine that this fails. It keeps up drama and adds stakes. Plus, watching things inch higher and higher makes for good progression. The character should not succeed at this point in the story, it builds dramatic tension. A show in which corporate rolls over and gives them everything at first would not only be boring from a narrative perspective, it would almost be irresponsible given the realities of corporate union busting efforts. The end of the season 3 finale into season 4 also finally declares an answer to Jonah and Amy's will they or won't they. To the definitive, they will. Amy and Jonah officially get together. The other major shift to the show's status quo around this time that's worth mentioning is Glenn steps down as manager and Amy takes the job. Eyes up. Set up for your rights. How to the people. Keep top. Hey, Sandra. Um, handing out some flyers? Yeah. You want one? Sandra says no to hate and yes to freedom. Oh. Seems uncontroversial. Mm. I'm not a hero. At this point, the last few seasons have done a fantastic job at expressing why collective action and ultimately unionization are necessary to fight back against the ways the parent corporation oppresses the floor workers in its unquenchable thirst for profits. And season four is when the explicit theme of unionization reaches its peak. Throughout the season, there's a running plot line about corporate continuing to cut hours at this store to the point that some of the workers aren't even really making a living wage. And also, having less people to work means that the store is understaffed, so a lot ends up not being able to get done or cleaned out. The hour cutting is not only bad for the workers, but bad for the store, and the owners refuse to do anything because doing so would require them to pay more money. That is, until an embarrassing tweet circulates of a picture of a cart full of meat rotting out in the open at the store, which wasn't caught because of the limited staffing. This embarrasses the Cloud9 brand, and corporate immediately gives them some hours back. Which is observed by a Jonah and Amy, who decide that they're going to set up a bunch of fake accounts and tweet embarrassing things about the store in an attempt to get back even more hours. This plot is almost immediately discovered by corporate, because quite honestly, Jonah and Amy do a really bad job at hiding it. How do you know it's one of us? Well, all the posts came from the same MAC address, and that device was logged into the employee Wi-Fi network. Who would be dumb enough to send incriminating tweets from the employee Wi-Fi? Corporate pretty quickly sends someone to investigate who made the tweets and to fire them. During this investigation, Carol, who has been the primary antagonist to Sandra throughout the entire show and is characterized by her propensity to take things too far, is particularly distraught that a man named Jerry left her for Sandra. So... Of course, she decides to tell the investigator that Sandra was the one who had set up the fake accounts. An account to which Sandra, whose willingness to 100% play into a lie if it gets her more attention and respect has been well established, absolutely plays into when she realizes how badass all her co-workers think it is. And the momentum of their praise leads her to declaring her intent to get the store to unionize. The last few episodes of the season are focused on this unionization push. 
Sandra can't be fired like corporate intends because when she starts talking about unions, laws around retaliation start kicking in. And she ends up following that thread to leading an entire large unionization push for the store. Now, Amy is actually not in support of the unions at first due to her position as manager and threats of closing the store, which puts her at professional odds with Jonah, who, after a couple episodes of uncertainty, joins the unionization push pretty quickly. Which makes sense, since he's been all in for unionization since basically the beginning of the show, before anyone else. All we have to do is keep her from talking about unions. Yes. What? Uh, it just feels weird. Isn't that like literally union busting? No! Well, what would you call it? I don't know. It's not like we're crushing a movement. We're just trying to... Send her a message? That sounds like we're breaking our legs. We just want to... Neutralize the threat, uh, get rid of the problem, uh, let her know she's messing with the wrong people. Something in that ballpark. It just feels like a red flag that everything you say makes it sound like villain. This Amy and Dina versus basically the entire rest of the store, but most especially Jonah and Sandra on unionization plotline, lasts until the season 4 finale, Employee Appreciation Day, where corporate takes things a step too far for Amy and calls in an ICE enforcement raid on the store in order to intimidate the branch, which leads to the detainment of Mateo. Want to start a union? So, that's it, right? The next season is all about setting up the union. Well, kind of. This is where things get a little weird around the theming, and that can be blamed on a number of different factors, both in and out of the show's hands. Just before, or early on in Season 5's airtime, it was announced that Amy's actor, America Ferreira, would be leaving the show and this would be her last season. At this point, it was in question what the show would look like without her, as she was a staple of the show and Amy was a vital character. The show insisted that it would continue on without Amy, and as someone that was watching the show as it aired, I was curious as to what that might look like. Well, the first half of the season was spent dealing with the unionization efforts as well as the fallout from the ice raid. This came together by the episode called Negotiations, which, while not technically a season finale, predated a significant season break. In this episode, Jonah and Sandra, having established a semblance of a union, get to actually go into negotiations with the corporate board of Cloud9 to actually enact change onto the store. Through these negotiations, in typical sitcom fashion, everything goes wrong. The professional negotiator has to go to the ER in the middle, and Jonah and Sandra are simply not very good at negotiating. However, Jonah threatens to strike, and it actually works. The board agrees to all the employees' demands. If all that sounds too good to be true, that's because it is. It's revealed at the very end of the episode that Cloud9 was bought by a large-scale temp company called Zephra with a hip young CEO, and that the new company didn't have to comply with anything decided in those negotiations. So that's the end of the union movement at Cloud9, and I'll just come out and say that this is the last time unions are seriously tried on the show. Now, I don't think that this was meant to be the last attempt at unionization. It was such an encompassing aspect of the show, and there was no indication at this time that the show anticipated ending as soon as it did. However, Season 5 aired between September of 2019 and April of 2020. Negotiations in particular was the last episode of 2019. And then, the funniest thing happened. So it's all a little up in the air. Just like this virus. <laughs> Just kidding. It's not airborne. Well, we don't know that. It could be. Anyway. Oh my god. Hey, everyone's overreacting. I mean, no friggin' way I'm missing out on spring break this year. Actually, the latest articles are saying that washing your hands isn't enough. We should be wearing face coverings, avoiding large groups. Like, say, 50-plus employees and an endless stream of customers? <gasps> that sounds like here. I do think that COVID ruined this element of the show. It really got in the way of whatever direction the show was actually planning on going. However, I also, possibly somewhat contradictorily, believe that Superstore rolled with the punches on COVID pretty well, all things considered. 
it certainly incorporated COVID into the plot of the show itself better than just about any other show I saw attempt to do so. Attention shoppers, we ask that you please not physically wrestle things from your fellow customers. There's a highly contractable virus out there that our country does not have a hold of. None of y'all listening, huh? All right, enjoy the apocalypse. Superstore being about a AAA department store and also being no stranger to commentary made it kind of a prime arena to tackle early COVID reactions in a thoughtful and funny way, as obviously department stores continued to run throughout the height of the pandemic. But as I made clear at the beginning of this, Superstore did not get through COVID unscathed. What COVID did do was destabilize production of the show and throw off the trajectory of the storylines they were in the middle of by throwing the entire world into chaos. The end of Season 5 had Amy going to California to get a job with corporate and leaving the show, but it wasn't too long before it was announced that Season 6 would be the last season. Now, I don't necessarily think that this is intrinsically a bad thing. The show got a final season to wrap everything up, which is more than a lot of shows get, and I was somewhat apprehensive about the show continuing without Amy anyway, as, in my experience, when shows start losing vital characters, it's usually the beginning of the end. And I figured that everything was happening so quick that America Ferrero would come back for the finale, and I was excited to see how they would wrap everything up. Okay, guys, come on. Obviously, Jonah's got some ideas. We haven't even let him talk. Jonah? I, I mean, I, I'm not sure that there's anything that we can do. Oh. I'm just trying to be realistic. I mean, we, we've been flattened by these guys over and over. I just... Yeah, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, hey, I'm not sure that's an idea so much as a downer, so maybe next time just don't stop the meeting if you don't have anything. Yeah. My bad. I realize I set that up like I was gonna rip into season six, but that's not what this is. I don't think that the show has, like, a huge dip in quality or anything. I think that season six is probably the worst season, but that's relative. There are less memorable episodes in season six, but there are also just less episodes in general in season six. And the season starts really well with the aforementioned COVID episode, Essential, which, in my opinion, is an all-timer. And the episode after that, California Part 2, is a solid send-off to Amy, although I guess it is kind of strange that they have this big emotional send-off to Amy when she's not gone for that long. It's a very short season, and she does come back for the finale. And to the show's potential credit for if it had continued without Amy, the Amulus episodes aren't bad either. They don't feel like there's something missing or anything. Although, that might have something to do with the fact that the season is so short that it doesn't feel like Amy really leaves in any meaningful capacity. A lot of the season has to do with Jonah dealing with his breakup with Amy and Mateo trying to gain citizenship. There's also a quick last-minute status quo shake-up, where Dina and Glenn become co-managers of the branch, and a fun Kids in the Hall reunion when David Foley guest stars in the episode Lowell Anderson, which sets up the conflict for the finale of this series. That conflict being that the employees find out that Zephra is planning on shutting down a number of Cloud9 locations, and that their store specifically is on the short list of stores slated to close down. So they enlist Amy's help, and they pull out all the stops that they possibly can for one last desperate plea for their store to remain open. We're not concerned this is hurting business. I might think twice about shopping at this store. Okay, yeah, a lot of feet turn up here. I'm sorry we're not literally perfect, Natalie. Yikes. We just, we, we keep trying to show everybody that we're the perfect store. And, and the truth is, we're not, okay? We're, we're just us. But we're here every single day. When it rains, when it snows, when it, when it tornadoes, when there's a plague and you're all safe at home, except for when you come here to cough, we're here just, just trying to get you what you need. And, and all we want is to keep doing that. Emotions running high here, preventing people from staying on topic. Back to you, Skip. 
this ends up not working. Or, well, it does work, but they find out that their store remaining open means that it'll stay open as a fulfillment center with a skeleton crew, which means that basically the whole staff will have to be laid off anyway. And I guess I have a little bit of an issue with that ending. Now, I am definitely no stranger to a bummer ending, and I think one can serve a narrative just as much, if not more, than having all the characters' goals be met. I'm reminded of the movie Z, which is an explicitly leftist drama about a time when cops collaborated with fascists in the assassination of a left-wing politician, and are investigated for it. And, spoiler alert for history, I guess, and you should still definitely watch this movie even if you do know what happens, but this doesn't end well. The ending of that movie not only expresses history as it actually happened, but also serves to narratively make you angry about systematic injustice. That is not what the ending of Superstore is. First of all, and this might go without saying, but liberal-leaning NBC sitcoms are a different beast from explicitly leftist prestige dramas. But also, shocking you into anger with the system isn't really what the ending of Superstore is trying to do. It's a sitcom. It ends with a send-off of the characters. The last scene of Superstore is Garrett giving a monologue about finding joy in your work and finding people you care about and wherever you happen to be over a montage that assures you that all the major characters land on their feet and they all remain friends. Glenn starts his own hardware store to continue the legacy of his father's store, Sturgis and Sons, which was put out of business by Cloud9. He even hires Cheyenne and Mateo, which works out especially well for Mateo, who is worried about finding work with his undocumented status. So that puts a little bit of a bow on that story arc as well. Amy and Jonah are shown to have gotten married and have at least one more kid together in addition to Amy's other kids who Jonah is helping co-parent. Amy continues to be a CEO and Jonah, the political activist that he is, gets to run for office. And Dina takes over the store as the manager of the fulfillment center and she hires on, as a skeleton crew, basically everyone that was important enough to be shown in the credits, but not so important that they needed their own entire thing. Like your Sandras, your Marcuses, etc. Now, you might get the impression from how I talk about this ending that I think that it's bad. And I genuinely don't think that it's bad. I don't think that the message, find joy where you can, is a bad one. Um... The Office, which I guess I'm spoiling here as well, ends on a very similar note, and I thought it worked really well for that show. But I can't help but be a little bit disappointed. The theme of unionization is so strong throughout most of Superstore, and I really like that theme. I think that pushing collective power is a great goal for an NBC sitcom and I believe that they should have pushed that theme to the very end, because I think that advocating for the unionization of workplaces is a good way to advocate for the betterment of everyone's lives, and not just the few people that are lucky enough to get a place in the credits. Moment of beauty? If you see me coming, better step aside. A lot of men didn't, a lot of men died. One fist of iron, the other of steel. If the right one don't get you, then the left one will. You load 16 ton, what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me, cause I can't go. I owe my so to the company store.